Good morning, this is Angela with Park Rose Permaculture. It is a gorgeous sunny day here in Portland, Oregon. We're having fuluary, which I'm trying to take advantage of. In permaculture, we try and strike when the iron is hot. When you have uh, conditions that are optimal for certain chores, sometimes you need to drop other things and make hay while the sun shines, right? So uh, for me, that means my big pile of mending in the living room is gonna have to wait. Right now, it's garden time. Yesterday, we were supposed to go on a hike as a family and we put it off in favor of doing like seven hours of yard work because it was just stunning out and there are so many things that need tending right now in my garden. So where you are, I realize it may be covered in snow and you're not getting a lot of garden work done. Maybe you can live vicariously through my 55 degree sunny day uh, and think about your future preparations in the coming weeks when these tasks are available to you. So I think today is some kind of big sports ball event. I didn't even realize it until I saw the posts on social media this morning while I was having my coffee. I do want to say the only sports I was tuned into is Erin Jackson winning the gold medal today in speed skating, which is just blows my mind. She's such an incredible athlete. I'm such a huge fan of hers. Um, anyway. So today I am working on tasks in the garden itself in C2, but I'm also working on things that need to be started indoors. I'm just potting them up outdoors to keep the dirt contained. And because why would I not be out here in the sunshine? So I'm working on planting my annual berries. Yes, I do grow three kinds of annual berries. So I wanna share those with you and my process for planting them up and why I think they are a great addition to your garden. Now I've talked about them in the past several times because I'm such a huge fan. And this is the genus Physalis. It is such a wonderful, delicious, and unusual food crop that is low fuss and really, really easy to grow if you have a sunny spot and produces way late into the fall in my climate until the end of October and sometimes into November. So it's just a really beautiful plant, a really long harvest of a lot of food, and it's super easy to so grow. So first, there's two kinds of physalis that I grow. Now, common names can be kind of confusing. Uh, a lot of folks refer to one species of plant by multiple common names depending on where you live. For example, the physalis that is my number one favorite is physalis peruviana. It goes by the common name Cape Gooseberry. It also goes by the common name Inca Berry. It also goes by the common name Golden Berry. It just depends on where you live. It is distinctly different from the ground cherry physalis peruviana. Pruinosa, which I always have a hard time saying, um, which is the other one that I grow. So we'll talk about ground cherries in a minute, but the uh, goldenberry or Inca berry is an upright, beautiful plant with kind of velvety leaves in the nightshade family. Both of these are in the genus Physalis. They're both nightshades. They're both Solanaceae. And it produces a little husked fruit looks like a tiny tomatillo, is related to tomatillos, but the fruit is much sweeter and is a golden orangey yellow color, depending on the variety, and has kind of like a pineapple-y flavor. I think they are my husband's favorite fruit. Now, I grow a million kinds of perennial fruit crops. This is one of the only annual fruit crops I grow, and sometimes it is a self-sowing functional perennial. It's an annual that sometimes I let the late... Um, uh, fruits just fall to the ground and they will germinate and make it all the way to maturity and fruiting next year. But sometimes if we have a really chilly spring, that stunts that whole process and all I get is a plant that doesn't have time to mature fruit. So I do want to start my own. In my climate, mid-February is the optimal time to be starting these. I think that's probably true for most climates, so you may live somewhere colder, but if your last frost day is like in mid-May, you really wanna be starting these indoors in February. Okay, now ground cherries are something that I've grown for probably 20 years, maybe more, and I think they're much more common. They're kind of low and sprawling, and the fruit is maybe half the size of a uh, Inca berry. It is not that dissimilar in flavor, but the problems with it are rodents really love it. It's low to the ground, so mice tend to eat the berries. And also they're more difficult to pick. The fruit is smaller, so it is more work to harvest and peel the diminutive ground cherries to get the same um, load, the same um, quantity of fruit. And they just are 
they take up more space in the garden because they're low and sprawling versus the Inca berry is very upright. I can grow things around the base of an Inca berry. Um, things that actually might like a little bit of shade because it grows up in this kind of like almost um, umbrella shape. And so it goes upright and then outward and can shade smaller plants underneath it. So I find that it works well in polyculture and eats up less ground space than the ground cherry. So the ground cherry, just as tasty, serves a different role. You might have more success growing it and you might be more familiar with it because it's been grown for a really long time. Now, the ground cherries, if you eat them under ripe, uh, they definitely can give you digestive upset. They contain solanine like any of the solanaceae or most of the solanaceae, I should say. And so just like you wouldn't want to eat a greened potato, as the physalis berries ripen, they become more digestible. And so you really don't want to eat the underripe ones. You want to wait until they fall off the plant. The husk is kind of drying and turning like a little bit brittle. And the fruit inside is really good and yellow. It doesn't have a green blush to it. If you find they fall off the plant because of a heavy rain or you knock into the plant, leave them on your counter and they will continue to ripen. So here's my setup here. So I'm I'm starting three different trays and in these pots, um, forgive my dirty nails, I got gardening hands y'all. In these pots, I'm gonna be starting three different groups of the physalis berries. And I will broadcast quite a few and then these will all get potted up. So this these six pots will probably eventually be, I'm hoping like maybe 60 plants. That's my hope and that way I can put some out in the farm stand. So the first one I'm starting is the, uh, my favorite Cape Gooseberry, there are many varieties. So, I'm always a big fan of Fedco seeds. I talk them up a lot. I think that they are just such a great company. I really like this variety Ambrosia and I've had really good germination with it and you can see it needs 115 days. So think backward count backward um, if you are planning to start this in your climate. This is true, four feet apart, they get quite quite large. Um, so I found that that's a good distance. Again, I can plant things underneath them because they are much more upright than the ground cherry. So I'm gonna start some of these. This is what the seeds look like when they come in this little wax paper packet. They're very small and I'm gonna plant them and they like to be surface sown and then just kind of mushed into the soil. So next I'm gonna be planting some of the ones I saved, actually just by saved I mean I neglected in my garden and they hit the ground and the husks skeletonize nicely and that makes them really easy to find in your garden if you wanna get the seeds from them. So I'm gonna be planting these as well. These are the saved seeds and they do come true from seed. So these are leftover from my purchased seeds. They'll keep for several years in a cool, dry setting. And I'm also gonna be planting ones that uh, I got from last year's harvest. Now the third I'm going to be planting is the ground cherry, Aunt Molly's ground cherry. These again, organic, I prefer to buy certified organic if I can afford it. If you can't, don't stress. It's more important that you grow using organic methods than to source your seeds organically, but I wanna support uh, co-op farmers who are growing using organic methods as well. So I wanna support the cultivation and production of seed stock through organic means whenever I can afford it. Okay, so the same thing. These are much lower to the ground. They sprawl around the ground and they need to be planted closer together. The ground cherry is a much smaller berry, as I said. And so I'm gonna be tucking these in around, um, but I don't enjoy these as much because I have to get down on the ground to harvest them and they're smaller and they take more work to dehusk. But I will be growing them because I want diversity whenever possible. Diversity increases resilience. And you can see they're really, really small. And I'm just gonna surface sow them. I'm just gonna sprinkle them. Now, because these seeds are last years, I'm not quite sure what my germination will be like. And I tend to be kind of a lazy, low effort seed starter. So I don't worry about perfectly spacing them. I just uh, sprinkle them around and then I wanna push them into the soil. You can, if you want to, put a scant eighth of an inch over the top, but you don't have to. And then I'm gonna water these from the bottom. 
and put them in my sunroom or perhaps in my living room in my window seat, which gets great southern exposure. The second set, I'm going to work on these. So if I open up the husk here, you can see the kind of like desiccated old fruit. And when I pop that open, it's full of, oh, I would say maybe 40 or 50 seeds inside. And I'm going to plant these and see how these do. Now, because I'm not really sure what the germination rate is going to be of the ones I saved myself because I'm lazy and I didn't bother to do a germination test, we will see, but I'm going to overplant and that way I can always prick out if there are extra rather than worrying about low germination. Same thing, open it up. There's the seeds and try these guys. Same thing. I want to put a little bit of soil over the top. Not too much. They don't want to be buried deeply. Folks asked what I use for my seed starter. I obviously use a peat-free mix. This is a mix of my home garden compost, purchased leaf mold, and a little bit of sand. And that's all I use. Um, you can make your own custom mix. I find for me, again, I just kind of use what I have around and I make it as free or cheap as possible. So now I'm going to do the ground cherries. And these did not come in a little envelope. They're loose, so just be careful. Sometimes when you order, you may get them in a little wax envelope if they're tiny seeds, and they may be loose, so don't let them go everywhere. Ground cherry seeds are pretty much identical. Physalis prunosa and Physalis peruviana have pretty much identical looking seeds. You might ask me, Angela, how do you know what's what? They do look a little bit different when they're germinating, and I don't actually usually label things just because I've got more than 20 years experience seed starting. I tend to know what things look like. And um, so I don't feel the need to label most things that I start from seed. Um, and I also, like this may sound a little smug, but I have a little bit of a photographic memory. So if I set it on the counter, I usually can close my eyes and I can remember what everything is. I can envision in my mind when I planted it and how it looks. So I don't usually worry about labeling. If that is not you, no shame in labeling. Don't feel that it's like a, a deficit to label your seeds just because I don't. I'm lazy. I have a lot of experience starting seeds and um, my brain really likes to retain plant information. So I could not tell you where I leave my car keys or um, remember where I have set my wallet when I get home, but I can remember the order in which I planted all of my seeds. So. So you can see they're all started. I will be watering these out here, letting the extra drip off of them. And then I will be taking them into the house where I will make sure the poodles don't knock them over and they stay watered. Now you don't want the soil to totally dry out and then you also do not want to overwater them and risk something like damping off. So these are pretty darn easy and reliable to start from seed. Mid-February is the time to get going on it so that you will have a successful harvest. And I will be uh, potting these up when they all germinate and they get one set of true leaves. I will prick them all out and put them in bigger pots. And hopefully, fingers crossed that it goes well, I will have some out in our Honesty Farm stand later in the spring. Okay, thanks for watching. I am now done starting these seeds and I am going to go shovel mulch because that's what I've got to do today. I owe y'all all a video about pruning my hardy kiwis. That is all shot. I finished doing that yesterday. I just have to edit the footage. And like I said, in permaculture, we want to make hay when the sun shines. So it is not the best use of, use of my time right now to be sitting indoors editing on my computer. And so I will be getting to that later this evening. But don't worry, I did not forget that I owe y'all a kiwi pruning video and um, I obviously I'm going to try and get this video out today on um, Aaron Jackson gold medal Sunday uh, or Super Bowl Sunday and we'll see how it goes uh, I may end up spending too much time outdoors and it may come out on Monday but either way if you're interested in supporting this channel, I have a Patreon down in the description. You can throw a couple of bucks at my PayPal as well. That is a really great way to say, Angela, we really value the work of Park Rose Permaculture and we wanna support you and your family. I will be back very soon for my permaculture garden, mess and all, real life and all, here in Zone 8B in Portland, Oregon. Thanks. So 
great way to support the work of Par Park Rose Permaculture.